Yes, Jessica. Um, I've, I've been, have, I have my laptop open because I, I want to check your facts. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you said about the decline in infant mortality, those are pretty profound numbers. Right. Um, and so I went online and it's down to 8.5% per thousand kids. Wow. That wow. is so low. And it's incredible to me. I think that you know, when we think about the most profound impacts that we can have, the future kids have futures is one of them. So I just want to thank you for your work. And um, I'm a big fan now. <laughs>
we don't think of it as essential. And what we try to talk about, um, you know, at the National Diaper Bank Network, and I know diaper banks across the country, is the fact that diapers and other hygiene products are not incidental. And I often ask people to think about what it feels like, you know, the day that you go out when you forget to brush your teeth, right? And I know I'm not the only person who's ever done that. <laughs> I didn't do it today. Um, <laughs> but when you do that, just that one little thing, all day, you're thinking, oh, you know, when you cover your mouth and you might not talk to some people, you, you are thinking about it. And what does that mean if you don't have toothpaste every day? Every day you're going out like this. And, and that is something so small that we can, on a policy level, address. You know, we know how much it costs to live in America. We have all sorts of um, calculators about what the self, you know, what, what is the self-sufficiency standard? What does it cost to live in different parts of the country? And we know that in almost all parts of the country, it costs twice the federal poverty level to meet all of your basic needs. So what are we doing with the, you know, 24% of American children who are living below the poverty level? We know their needs aren't being met. So as much as we want to think about the big things, and I would never want to stop thinking about the big things, I think that what we bring and what you guys are talking about is this idea of you also have to think about the little things, and the little things may make a really big difference in that direction. So that wasn't a question, I just wanted to... <laughs> um, are there other questions that people... Yes, Vicki? Thank, thank you all so much uh, for, for your comment and for your work. I wish we could get this, uh, this type of research done in every community. I just can't imagine what you <laughs> do to help policymakers to really understand and to really to start the services. I mean, I think about the supermarket and that. So, anybody's got any ideas? Mm -hmm. You know, so we were um, we were working, you know, obviously closely with the, with the last administration on, on some of these ideas. Um, and you know, I I use when when I'm doing you know more general talks on poverty and mental health. I mean, I always use that as a platform to talk about specifically this issue. Um, and I think that, you know, it's just sort of, you know, the others comment on, but I think, um, you know, that is really, we see the value of it. I mean, the second I can, you know, reference a study and actually quantify, you know, the numbers and all, and I think we hope to really soon have some of the data about parenting um, from other communities that we're partnering with too in other states. Uh, but the second I can do that, I mean, you get a seat at the table, with, you know, with a lot of policy. So I think that really should be a broad goal. I know NDBN is really helping to, to, to vision that. Um, I think the other piece is what I talked about with the, the work that's going on around as we change the conversation around healthcare reform and, and ACA and wherever that may go. Um, but I really do see, just from my own experience, getting bipartisan support around this issue of tying diapers into healthcare visits and other you know, provision of public health. And, and you know, as both other panelists talked about, um, you know, being able to tie diapers into this broader system of healthcare provision. I mean, you know, I, I've done some work with, with Bear Necessities in Clinton, I'm just thinking, and I, and I just see, you know, they just do this phenomenal job of, you know, they get families in the door with diapers, but then there's so much else they, they're able to provide at that, at that time, you know, that just brings everyone in, and it's really phenomenal work to see. And I think, you know, having that model where it's really comprehensive, so things like bundled payments, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, we talk about, um, um, you know, uh, patient-centered medical homes, and that idea of medical homes, including diapers. And I think there's some ideas that we can really go there and, and the research can help bring us to that model. So. Right, no, I think that the idea, I think that this is really, um, you know, a lot of what you heard yesterday on um, Kara from First Focus talk about, that while well, we're here talking about this specific bill, and we're looking for people to sign on to this specific bill, the issues are much bigger. And so, you know, it, it things like how, your insurance pays your doctor. Those things matter. And things like bundled payments, you know, it's important to understand how insurance works, both public and private. 
and what that really means. What does it mean to be insured? What does it mean when you get the bill from your insurance that says, you know, provider charge this, your insurance paid this, you owe zero, right? How did that happen? It, those are good things to sort of figure out there. Yes. Uh, I have two comments and a question. First is piggybacking off what she said. Uh, we're currently, I'm from the Mississippi Delta, and we're currently working with the Ole Miss um, with, uh, Center of Population Studies, and he's quantifying some of our data right now. And I was seeing if I can maybe get with him so he can kind of replicate that in the Delta where we're at. Uh, he, that data, he would, he would love. <laughs> um, and also, it is um, political season, and we're having mayor elections. I would like to get with those two candidates and kind of talk about the health council that you that y'all did in Baltimore because the infant mortality rate in the Delta has increased instead of decreased. And I currently work for Healthy Star, and that's our mission. And um, one of the things we're noticing is the rollover deaths. And she, you talk about the bigger picture, and it's more housing and how many people are in a, in a room more so than some of the other things. But I was. Wondering if we, you know, I can talk with y'all and kind of get some of those things. And from the nurses' perspective, I work out of a hospital working with some of the parents, and we get calls when the parents leave the hospital because they don't have anything. They don't even show up for prenatal care, so they come and they deliver, and they have they have nothing. So our doctor bank it does meets those needs and foster care. We have a lot of foster care moms that come in. They the uh, Department of Human Services take the children and give them to them with nothing. So they come to us, one parent came, the folks, she had twins. They, uh, the diapers were soiled, the whole building was smelling, and she said, I, I, I just got them, they gave me nothing, could you please help? So, you know, these that's, issues... That's one of the things that that Cradles to Crayons does with their kid packs. <coughs> they calls frequently from someone who just said, I, I just got three foster kids yes. and they have nothing, the clothes on their back, That's it. and they provide those kid packs, but diapers are a yeah, we do big boarders. part of that too. Okay. So I'm going to let you guys speak to that if there's something. I, I guess what I would say is we can definitely, so first of all, I'm sure they're happy to talk to you. We also can connect you after the fact. If you talk with Allison, she'll be happy to connect you directly with all the three of our panelists and, you know, I will speak for Megan and say that we're, you know, she, we're very interested in having this replicated anywhere, um, you know, and that that's that's the goal. Um, but I, I think that you're bringing up foster parents is really interesting because I think it's one of these things when you hear people talk about, um, you know, the government taking care of people. So we give children to foster parents because there are problems, don't, but we don't support that. You know, when, when, when charity is the response to caring for people's basic needs, we're missing something. And I think that's really what we're here talking about. It's amazing. We do amazing work. You know, collectively, we distribute hundreds of millions of diapers. It is amazing. But, but the problem is that we have to do that, right? I mean, so it's great that we do it, and we all should feel really, really proud, because I know many diaper bankers, first off, most diaper banks do things other than diapers, right? We do all sorts of stuff. We call ourselves diaper banks, but we, we give out all sorts of products. But many of us, work with skeleton staffs. I would venture to say some of the people here don't have staffs and that they're fully volunteer. Yeah. I worked as a volunteer executive director for seven years. But you know what? That is a privilege, right? So people can look at me and say, oh, that's great that she does that. Well, it's because I could, not because I am such a giving person. I didn't actually give anything up to do it. So I think that it's really important that we sort of go back and always remember that. 
and it's great we're doing this, but the fact is, we have children who are so poor they don't have access to clean diapers. Yes, ma'am. I mean, just the, I just, I don't even know how to just drive home like nationally. There's nobody that I have spoken to since I started this work that that thinks that there is not some sort of safety net program out there for diapers. There's nobody that I come into contact. It is just a 100% assumption that people can use their food stamps, can use their car, use their SNAP, use their cards to purchase diapers and they hear these stories about people, you know, people buying candy or whatever they think they're buying with these cards or whatever, you know, God forbid they bought an iced tea because that's crazy. They should just drink water for, you know, ever, but whatever. They, they, they just don't, like, there's, there's no conversation that I've had with anybody on any level, um, whether it be a government official even, whether it be, you know, a, a council person, a foundation person. They just, like, I don't know what else we can do to educate around the fact that there just isn't any other program or money that's addressing. Well, I think there are two things. I think one is we're doing it. Right. Yeah. by talking about of it. Course. But I think that um, that's why it's so important to continue to have the conversation. And what Rosa Deloro said in that introduction was she didn't know it. And, right. and Rosa is an amazing right. representative who fights for women's rights, for children's rights, for the rights of all people. She didn't know right. there wasn't a program. Um, but I would like to give Gabe an opportunity, if you'd like to tell us or if you have any ideas of how we can um, sort of effectively speak to our local public health departments about this in a way that might be useful on both ends. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think there's, for us and, and I imagine for a, a lot of public health entities, we are trying to, to squeeze water from a stone mm -hmm. on a lot, in, a, in a lot of ways. We've got, there are so many, so many health issues in, in Baltimore that, um, and the other, the other part of that is that we sometimes do what we've always done. And so having these kinds of conversations, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I knew that this was an issue before you came to Baltimore to have that conversation at, with, with one of our local Traffic leaders, and she said to the health department, "You should you need to be here." And it's 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 such a little thing that made such a big difference that having these conversations is really important. And if if I don't know, it sounds like people here are from all over the country, um, and that's great. Call your call your local health department and have a conversation about this, and call your local legislators. It's a, it, this is a, a easy win issue. Local and so can people say, you know, I was lucky enough to speak to the uh, chief of staff of the Baltimore D uh, Public Health Department. He thought this was a great idea. Sure. I, I think it's helpful. I, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. It's, you know, so there are some places, like New Haven, for example, that love to be first. There are some places that don't, that really want to make sure that they're not going to do anything that is gonna step on anyone's toes. So if you're in one of those places where people don't want to be the first ones, see, you know, I heard this guy talking, he was great, and they're doing this amazing stuff in Baltimore. Michelle. I thought about a comment and a question. First thing you heard coming and speaking. Um, the comment is, we did research with the families who received our diapers, and even though they received a pack of diapers that said they were made in North Carolina, over 90% of them felt they were provided by the government. So that was just an interesting thing that we got from the survey. But that was just my comment. My question is actually for you. Um, uh, so you talked about silos, which we see a lot in the communities, where a statewide organization in, in all communities we see these silos. So I'm wondering about the challenges that you came across in trying to work together, to bring these groups together, and to have such a successful response. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult when you're <coughs> trying to get 100 executive directors with 100 uh, operations teams and, and say, we probably don't need 
all of this, we would probably spend more of this money on service provision. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not an easy conversation to have. Mm -hmm. And you know, we often fight for our own organizational interests over that of the community that we serve. Mm -hmm. And that is not, okay. not productive. It's kind of productive. And so there's a certain amount of putting aside ego that has to happen. And it's been a long process. We've had, we've, we, there are still some institutions in, in Baltimore that hold out and, and don't want to be part of this initiative for exactly that, that reason. They want to do this other thing and they want to do it separately. Um, so I'm Nancy Woodland. I am the Director of Public organization in Seattle called Westside Baby, and we have a diaper bank, and then we also do clothing and car seats, the other basic needs. Also lucky enough to be a founding member of the NPBN board, and sat in on the early meetings with Joanne and Kimberly Clark, where, and, and other meetings with people with the Children's Defense Fund, leads who all said they had no idea that diaper need was an issue. Um, and that was eight or nine years ago. And um, and at that time, I ran a really little organization, and so this was a this was a big conversation. Um, the difference between that and now is people no longer are surprised. In Seattle, everybody knows about diaper need. They don't necessarily know what to do about it. And that's where we come into you know you're speaking from public health, you're speaking from the medical field, and um, Megan is speaking from mental health. One of the things about diaper need is the overwhelming nature of how much we can talk about it. It, it fits into every category. Um, and so my question is, when we're meeting with each of your um, groups, what is the one thing that jumps out the most to you as the, you know, the walk-in question? Or walk-in statement, I yeah. guess. I think that if, if I owned a, if I owned and operated a diaper bag, I would call all of my legislators and invite them in to volunteer for a day yeah. and show them the, the parents that come in and the kids that come in and, and the work that's done and the work that's not done by the government. And let them see firsthand the safety nets that exist and the safety nets that don't. And begin that policy conversation that way. And how about in the medical field, like at a hospital, trying to engage that hospital with, to support this? I think that the employees themselves, uh, the nurses that I work with, a lot of them <coughs> are resentful to the mothers who, and if, if, I, if I sense that there's a need for a patient, they don't come right out and say, listen, I'm not going to have any diapers while I go home, can you hook me up? I will hook them up with the diapers because <laughs> they're provided. We don't purchase the diapers, they're provided. And they are, um, they're there. People waste them, the dad will do the tape wrong, toss them in the trash. And... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not boring. laughs> Dave, you're just going to come down and share, baby. We'll wrap diapers. <laughs> I'll give you a lesson. And it'll be fun. <laughs> so it'll be fun. I've heard some of my coworkers say, um, oh, I went in the patient's drawer and there was three packs of diapers in there. So she took them out. And I, and I tell the parents, put this in your bag. Just put this in your bag. And I'll give them diapers whenever they ask, because how can I not? I know that these people are struggling, and they're going to go home, and they're going to try to make this thing stretch. They're not having baby showers like my daughter is expecting, and who's going to get tons and tons of everything. And who can afford to buy diapers when she needs them? So these people, they come in and they say, I have nowhere for my baby to sleep. I have no car seat. I have no way to clothe my baby. They have um, baby packs, we call them, that people provide gently used baby clothes. And we, we have a pack of clothing for the babies. And they'll get a pack and play from the hospital, and they'll get a car seat. Um, but diapers are just kind of hanging out there. Mm. So I give them to them when they ask me. Like I said, that every nurse that comes in will say, oh, a new, break, a new face. I need diapers. And you look in the drawer and there's two in the pack. So you give them a box of diapers, you know, a pack of diapers. And one of those packs of diapers oh, is only going to last them a, a little more than a day. It's not like a, a huge box of diapers. They tell me when they give the diapers out by the social workers, they'll give them a sleeve. The, those multi-packs come with a sleeve. So they may get a dozen diapers. 
until when the next time when they get diapers. So educating the nurses, I think, that there is a need. Mm -hmm. And the nurses will say, I don't know why they don't just use clogged up in the I use the <coughs> and, and so before I mean, let you answer, I want to say one thing. You brought up an incredibly important point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we all struggle with is the fact that there is such venom mm -hmm. among many people that we speak to about people in need. Mm -hmm. There are lots of assumptions that are made. There, there are a lot of people say really horrible things. Why did she even have that baby? She can't provide for it. Mm -hmm. I hear that a lot. Yeah. I would bet everybody in this room has heard that, right? Because anytime any of us write something that's published in a newspaper that has online comments, that's what people Don't say. Read the Don't read the comments. <laughs> but, but it's just, it's really important for you to say that because I think another thing that all three of you talked about is part of what we do is give people dignity. Because what I know every person in this room believes, and I know this, is that nobody has a baby and doesn't want to take care of them, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. And so if we know that and we all can believe that, then together the answer has to be, you know what? We're all doing the best we can. But, but I think that that's a really important point, and I really appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. It's also why it's so important that AWAN is actually partnering with NBN. Um, and so you're internally raising the bar on the conversation. And in Seattle, AWAN is doing diaper drives and engaging and spreading the word on our behalf. So that kind of support and, and we do have, is helpful. And we do have to thank Huggies for that relationship. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I just want to say that I work with Joan, and um, instead of adopting a person for Christmas this year, we did our diaper drive. Okay. So we're hoping to do that again next year and maybe make it hospital wide. That's the goal. Hospital wide. That's the goal. Excellent. Thank you. And now, Megan, we will. Uh, I just, you know, no, you know, my one fact, you know, I mean, so in one study, it's one study, but it was the number, I mean, now we're replicating two of our studies, but the number one predictor of postpartum depressive symptoms, diaper name. I think that's great. And I think, you know, the same piece about educating mental health clinicians understand this as well. Yeah, right, and I think it's also really great to be able to say this is a study that was, um, you know, done by a Yale University academic. I think that it really does give it more weight, and we should use that because it, it does really help when you talk about that. I saw you had a question in the back. I was thinking a lot of times we do treat it as charity, 
Um, I think it's definitely an economic justice issue. Cause, mm -hmm. So I was curious if you or anyone actually in the room um, have seen any examples of groups working with groups that organize around wages or groups that organize labor, just unique um, coalitions that don't sort of separate the fact that this isn't just a random feel-good issue, this is because we're connected to deeper mm -hmm. systemic issues, and that, I guess, I just pose to anyone in the room. Well, I'm, I'm going to start, but please thank you. Yeah. And we really appreciate um, the Representative Lee's support. One of the amazing thing about diaper banks is that probably every single diaper bank in this room could answer your question in a different way. One of the things that we believe and, and that we've really stri strip, strove, we strive for um, at the National Diaper Bank Network is that organizations are organic. So we don't have one way to do to, to, to open a diaper bank. There are lots of ways to do it, and, and it's different in every community. And there are people here, many of them, who sit on early childhood councils, who sit on economic development councils, who sit on different, um, different councils or groups that are appointed by either local or state officials. Because what we try to do is bring exactly that voice of saying, you know what? If you, you can't be self-sufficient if you don't have money. And so we frame it in a lot of different ways. You know, it's economic justice, it has to do with parenting, it's public health, it's all these different things. And I don't know if there are others who want to sort of give some of those specific examples. Joe, um, in Connecticut, we have an organization called the Connecticut Alliance for Basic Human Needs. We're looking at just that, you know, the economic justice of it. Uh, but as you said, a lot of other bankers sit on many different councils, but that's just one example of it. That um, you sit on the steering committee. Yes, that I go to the steering committee. So being uh, at the table to be able to talk about diaper need as it relates to these other public policy issues, to be able to talk about diaper need, but to get buy-in from those other organizations and we're able to really amplify our voice and our impact in our own community to actually help make that change. And we're always looking to sit on all of the committees, <laughs> go to all the meetings, uh, just to make sure that we're able to do that. But it's a great point. Well, um, part of our founding mission is about connecting families, and that was our sort of our founder's mission. So, yes, on the ground level, we are delivering diapers and other essential items to our families, but the other sort of piece of our mission is a lot. Uh, many of our items come from donations from families of means, and that they know that they are directly connecting with the families that are in need of those items, um, we are hoping to bring about increased social consciousness and social awareness of families living in their own communities. Many times in Baltimore, it could be simply like a mile away from you know where they are living and, um, and just to make those needs and those struggles very real um, across socioeconomic um, lines is definitely sort of the background in all that we do so that we hope um, in making this connection when somebody's handing down an article of clothing or a pack of diapers or a stroller and putting it in the hands of a family um, living in a different circumstance within their own community, um, we hope in a very real way that is bringing about a, a broader sense of, um, of awareness of, this, of that economic injustice that's going on. So um, we're always really mindful of building those connections. And so it's not directly political, but it is sort of building those seeds so that when these issues arise around living wage um, or other issues, that those families are have that connection built in, that sort of awareness built in that they might not have already had. That might have been just a very abstract thing, you know, those people. And you know, we hope that we're breaking down those lines. I think there are actually a couple of um, people who've had their hands <coughs> um, One of the things we're doing to work around social justice is I'm also a lactation specialist, like you look. And um, one of the things we do is um, we're working with uh, legislation on both how doctors tie into all of this um, in our state on wage and you know getting uh, employees to. Uh, allow women to breastfeed. 
and one of the social justice issues that if they don't have clean diapers, if they don't have these other needs, these other things, they can't work. And at our particular diaper bank, we actually uh, allow some of our participants to volunteer. And they come in and they get job readiness skill. We teach them about resumes, how to dress. We have two of them who now have gained employment based on a referral from us. We Even the dads come in and they provide services. So we're um, working with our local uh, Tri-County Workforce Development. I sit on the uh, Chamber of Commerce Board, uh, Industrial Foundation. We're doing all of these things to try to improve maternal health. And um, child welfare. So, so thank you. And what that just was, was a commercial to help us continue to support Healthy Start in the federal budget. Wasn't that? That was my thought. And so having that information because people do kind of pigeonhole it like why didn't they, why do people have kids that can't afford them or maybe they're not working and to say, look, these people can't make ends meet. You know, they're really struggling and they're not able to send their child to daycare. Um, so having that data to know who we're serving and to be able to share that has really made a difference. And reaching out to, you know, particularly people in our community who may not be as progressive as what's going on in Baltimore. So it's helped make a difference. Thank you. I'm going to let um, we have a couple more comments. One, Nancy, Corinne, and then we're going to finish up and let the panel have last words. Right, thank you so much for being here. And I am uh, the executive director of Modesty Public Bank and Bank in Essex County, New Jersey. Yay! Yeah. And one thing that you know, I really had, I heard someone in here share that. A lot of people are not aware in your own community. They're, they're not aware of a diaper bank. Like I'm, I get real excited when they say, "What's a diaper bank?" I'm like, "How much time do you have?" <laughs> I'm going to tell you what we do. But what I'm noticing is, uh, I have a lot of. I find myself basically kicking down doors because uh, because they're not aware of. Uh, what it is we do and how uh, poverty and, like she said, economic justice impacts diaper needs so, and it impacts so, so many other things that they don't really want to get involved. And I, it takes a lot of time. You talked about that skeleton crew, like just me and four volunteers, and I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm working out of my house. I'm storing stuff in my garage, and I'm taking calls, and, and this is with a full-time job, a husband, another job, children, grandchildren, and I do all of this, but it's a joy. You are among friends here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have a similar story. We have my own personal um, experience with Tanith and, 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 and uh, Wick and all of that stuff, but it's another population called the working poor. Mm -hmm which a lot of people kind of lose. They kind of lose that population. So I've, had, I've gotten a lot of calls from women that are working every day with little ones that don't have enough money for diapers because they're paying rent and getting back and forth to work. And they have a, a, a car that's breaking down twice a month and they just, they just can't make ends meet. So I'm servicing a lot of them also in addition to my other partners that I deal with, I'm servicing them, and it's just it's heartbreaking to me because that I can look in their eyes and I can see that that was once me. So I need to push forward a little more, a harder than what I'm already doing, and it's just it's just sad. And, but um, I'm so grateful to be a part of this group here and, and the National Diaper Network and my two mentors over here. I mean, I can do anything. I'll be very quick. Um, the connection of families with needs and those that have needs is an important uh, point. 
However, I'll also tell you that when, in our diaper bank, and I think many of you will experience this, a lot of the incoming donations come from the families we've given items to. So they'll walk in with a package of diapers, they flag me down walking in a parade to hand some five bucks because I gave them diapers once and they're, you know, the providers are coming in with the bags back from the families. And those families could consign the stuff, they could give it away to their friends, but they send it back to Westside Baby so that we can send it back out. And I think that's just as important as a, a connection and a, an opportunity for dignity and service as everything else. Thank you, Nancy. I was just going to echo sort of about evaluation. What we found was that people started talking to us when we had hard numbers. So we started doing evaluation on the impact of diapers on the economics for the families um, and the mental health. So how the moms stop and how the dads stop. And when we could say diapers allow families to go to work. Diapers allow families to feel good about themselves as parents. And we could point to numbers. People would talk to us. The Department of Health would talk to us when they wouldn't before. Um, funders would talk to us when they wouldn't before. And it started a conversation. Um, the numbers, I think, made a big difference. Uh, and that, that is propelling us in some different directions. I, I think it's also, if you, if you go that route, if you start down the numbers route, people take you more seriously. And I hate to, I hate to say that, but it's, it took us a long time to realize that. Um, the Department of Health is willing to talk to you more, you know, because you, you've got some data to back it up. Um, the research you're doing is so powerful. And, and I, I think it makes a big difference. Thank you. Um, and I know I said that I was going to let you guys have last remarks, but I just want to welcome Abby from um, Representative Ellison's office. She has just been instrumental, and I want to thank her. <laughs> We've already talked about you, but I just wanted to say <laughs> um, we're just we have, we have a couple minutes left, and I thought that I would give you each an opportunity if you have um, last words if you want to start on the second. Um, you know, I just will be really quick and just pick up on that theme of data and, and mention that it's, it's you know as the North Carolina and colleague shared, you know, it can be um, anywhere from reading to you know collecting demographics on who you're serving, um, you know, to make that case about a picture of these families. So it can be you know that sort of that piece that can be telling the stories. I think you know it's not only quantitative you know, empirical numbers too that are so helpful, but also a lot of these stories you know are, are so powerful. So you know, and then it can be too. So you know, data doesn't have to be really scary. It can be it can be those kind of things. So. Thank you. For my part, I, I think uh, from speaking with my coworkers about coming down here, uh, some of them are like, "You down there for?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of important that we put diapers on the babies. I said, and you know that we have people coming in who have no place for baby to sleep. They have no, um, they have no car seat for the baby. They have nothing for the baby, and. We need to adjust our attitudes about these people and about their circumstances. And many are not just deadbeat people who couldn't bother to work. These are people who want to work, who have lost their job, found themselves in the circumstances out of their control, and we need to provide them with the dignity that they deserve and help them with their babies. Thank you. Um, I'll just say, I, I think that while that, that data is very important, and evidence is very important for that. But we have to strike a balance between the amount of time and energy that we put towards evaluating and the amount of time and energy that we put towards advocating and the amount of time and energy that we put towards service provision. There's a, there's a balance that we have to strike there. And I think in, in Baltimore specifically, we sometimes spend too much time on the data and evaluation pieces and not enough time on the service pieces. Um, but I do want to say thank you to everybody who's here. Um, I've never met such a wonderful group of diaper bankers. <laughs> <laughs> keep doing what you're doing because it's very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. You know, we, we really do appreciate it, and I think that. You know, before I let um, Allison and Troy come, come up and talk about sort of what, what the rest of the day has, I want to say that um, hearing all of this makes me so happy because you know, when we first started at DBN, we made a conscious decision to have a mission that was threefold. Definitely giving out diapers is an essential part of what we do. We do 
Equally as important is supporting diaper banks across the country and being able to do things like bring us all together because together we have more of a voice. But the third thing is raising awareness and advocating. And from the beginning, that's been essential because we do have to do all of those things. And each part impacts our ability to go further. So I think that the more we all look at all of those areas, we look at the outputs, the number of diapers, we look at the outcomes, what happens for families, the in increased attendance at daycare, um, you know, increased less lessened <coughs> internal depression. And we also look at how we're changing the conversation and society. And so I think that's really important. So thank you all for coming. And here is Alison Weir to talk about the rest of the day.